you happen to go ahead and look at your calendar on your phone, or if you have a hard copy at home, you probably notice that your calendar says, like mine, that today is considered to be Palm Sunday. If you wonder what that is, that is a commemoration to remember that this would be the day that Jesus would have entered into Jerusalem, not on a horse, not with a spear in hand, not with any type of blowing of a trumpet to announce his arrival, but on the the foal or the back of a donkey. But everybody recognizes that this man, this man is our king, and they are going to cry out with the loudest of voices, Hosanna in the highest, they are going to praise him, they are going to take off their coats that many of you are wearing, and they will lay them in the middle of the street. If they happen to have palm branches, they will cut them down, And they will lay them on the street. And they would welcome this man. This Jesus. But how does a crowd that is so overjoyed with the presence of Jesus, not but a few days later, want to see Him dead? And instead of crying out, Hosanna in the highest and welcoming this King, now their, crowds, their, their cries and their voices are nothing more than crucify Him, crucify Him. We have no king but Caesar, crucify Him. Leaders will say that we need to kill this man because it is sufficient for one to die in the place of an entire nation. They will manipulate the judicial system. Not one, not two, but three liars will come forth and they will bear false witness about this man who just a few days prior was welcomed as king. He will be stripped mostly of his clothes. He will be beaten with sticks. He will be uh, slapped with an open hand and then he will be slapped with the back of a hand. There will be people who will spit on him. There will be people who will clothe him with a purple robe and they will mock him. You're the king. Surely you can change this. They will take a crown of thorns and they will twist it in their hands and then they will not place it but shove it on the top of his head. And they will continue to beat him more. How does a crowd turn from a welcoming, overjoyous crowd to such a vindictive one? And even more than that, how could a man like this, who followed a God that he proclaimed and said that he had come to reveal to the fullest, allow such a tragedy and travesty of justice to undertake? How could he sit by and watch as nails go through the palm of his hands and how nails could go through the top of his feet? Why would a God allow such a brutal instrument And a brutal way of suffering and death take place on a man who did absolutely nothing but good. How could he do all of that? How could he allow all of that? Because he had come to rescue us. And not just us. But the answer to our question about how this God could allow his main representative go through all of these things does not begin in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That's not the beginning. I actually want you in your heart and your mind, if you are familiar with the Bible you hold in your hands, to go backwards with me. A few thousand years prior. As this story opens up, we find that there is a man who has now ascended to the throne of the most powerful empire at the time. It's known as the Egyptian Empire. This man is going to be responsible and the sons that he will bear will be responsible of bringing in and maintaining Egyptian glory and honor. They will make masterful works of art and architecture. But they will do so off the backs of an enslaved people. This people will have been in slavery, by the time this story opens up, they will have been in slavery for over 400 years. And each day, at the beginning of the day, and at the end of the day, this group of enslaved people will cry out, God, where are you? Save us. 
Deliver us. Bring us. Remember us. Be with us. And for 400 years, each and every day, from a human point of view, it would look like this group is ignored. And that their cries just fall on deaf ears. But one day, one day, there is this man who appears. He's about 80 years old and he just appears out of nowhere. And he comes with a message of this Yahweh, this God. And he goes directly to the man who is sitting on the throne of Egypt. And he says, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. And from that moment, there is a war that takes place between the man who sits on the throne of Egypt and this backwater shepherd who comes out of the middle of nowhere. And it's a war that takes place. It's a war that's fought. But it's not between armies. There are no spears that are thrown. There are no arrows that are shot. There are no, no cries of, of a background, no battle cries, no amazing speeches. There's just this representative who sits on the Egyptian throne and this representative who is God's chosen leader and this chosen leader of God will through mighty power plague this ruler and plague this Egypt each plague getting worse and worse and worse and worse until finally the worst thing that could possibly happen to a human being happens the death of a firstborn a child And it's not a child in terms of just simply literally being a child. It could have been a grown individual. As long as you were the firstborn and you were not covered under the instructions of the God of Israel and the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the firstborn would have his or her life forfeited. It would be gone. In Israel, this people that were enslaved who who built Egypt from the ground up, Well, if they followed the instructions of this chosen leader, if they followed his path, well, they would find freedom. And they would find freedom in the most remarkable of ways. They would actually come to a body of water. And this body of water, now known as the Red Sea, would be split in half. And they would walk over on dry ground. And when the enemy tried to pursue them or would pursue them, the water came crashing down and flooded them and destroyed them. And Israel on the other side, this enslaved people are now free. They are now free to worship and they are now free to follow and they are now free to live for this God. I am the Lord is the refrain of the first five books of your Bible. This is a short summary of what you know of as the Exodus. And out of this story, we get seven major themes. That there's a wicked tyrant, in this case a pharaoh, who doesn't care about people. They are just a means to an end. He will use his power to enslave. He will use his power to bring fear. He will use his power to kill. And he does so without prejudice. God's chosen leader actually has a name. His name is Moses. He grew up in this Pharaoh's house, is educated in their system, but he runs away because he commits something that even he can't believe he did. He commits a murder. And yet, God calls him from where he is and brings him back to the place that he doesn't want to go. But he goes. And through Moses, God plagues Egypt and saves Israel through the Red Sea. And prior to that evening of that salvation and that deliverance, God provides Israel a meal. It's not just a meal so that they can leave on a full belly. It's a meal that they can remember. We were once slaves. It's a meal that they remembered once a year. Everything stopped. There was no farming. There was no business. There was no buying. There was no selling. There was no trading. There was nothing. And for a whole week, we're going to remember this meal. And we're going to build our entire life around it as a group of people. And we're going to remember we were slaves. And we're going to eat bitter herbs to remember how bitter it was. And we're going to eat all kinds of things that are going to remind us. And it's going to touch our senses. So that we won't forget 
where we were and what God did and where we are now. You know that meal is Passover, and you probably see that on your calendar. As Israel crosses over that Red Sea, they, they come across and they, they finally experience freedom. After 400 plus years of slavery and everything else, they finally discover freedom and can live free and they are provided a new way of living. At the base of a mountain of all places, they're given ten rules for life. And they're not rules or just a set of instructions, but they, as this chosen leader will say in another book at the end of Deuteronomy, this is your life and I want you to choose life. If you, if you follow this, it isn't a just a check mark. It isn't just simply you did what was right. You find life. You find life. And every day they are reminded that this God has not left them nor forsaken them because every morning they wake up and there's a pillar of cloud. And every night when they go to bed, there's a pillar of fire. And they are reminded that God is with us. Wherever we go and whatever we encounter, He is there with us. Until he ultimately rests in a big tent that we call a tabernacle. And later in, in one of the seven eight wonders of the ancient world, Solomon's temple. And there they would be in what is known as the promised land. From that place, this, this place that everybody would just bypass. It's just a great trade route, but there's really not much value there. There, this small group of people compared to other nations would be a light. There would be a light. And they would show people. They would reveal God and they would show His way of living. Well, what ends up happening after that doesn't go as well, or, as, well as you think it would. They actually go like this through the rest of their history. They go like this. Some months and some years, they're really good. And some months and some years, they're really bad. And they actually get conquered. Out of all that work from Egypt, they get conquered by other nations. Philistines, the Moabites, Persians, Babylonians, Assyrians. Until we get to a specific moment in time, and it is now the greatest empire that has enslaved them, the Roman Empire. And they know that they're slaves because they're taxed. They know that they're slaves because there are Roman soldiers who walk even their dirt roads. They know that they are not free. And throughout their history, Israel hung to a promise that one day God would bring somebody, somebody, he would bring them, and He would save us. And no longer would we have this trajectory of our life, but here we would rise and we would stay risen. But it doesn't happen. Until, until, 400 years after one of God's main spokespersons, for 400 years God had been silent. But there comes a man out of a place called Nazareth, the equivalent of a small town in America that has one caution light and perhaps a stop sign. And that's it. And he comes out to the River Jordan and he meets a man who's wearing camel skin, eating honey and eating locusts, which we'll about see in a couple of months when they all emerge for the summer. And this man who is wearing those peculiar clothes will be proclaiming a baptism for, of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And this man out of Nazareth will come to this other individual wearing these clothes and he will just simply look him in the eye and say, I need to be baptized. To which the other man will say, nope, that's not it. You got it backwards. I need to be baptized by you. Only to hear in response, no, you let it be so, for now is sufficient for the righteousness of God. And so that man will yield and he will baptize this man from Nazareth. And then the most remarkable thing happens. The sky will open up, the clouds will part, 
And something like a dove will descend. And then finally a voice is heard. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we learn at the tender age of around 30 or so that this son, this man out of Nazareth, is no ordinary man. He's known as Jesus, and everybody that is around will just be mystified by him, and they'll be perplexed. I thought he was a carpenter's son. Didn't we see him running around when he was five years old and seven years old and ten years old? Didn't his parents lose him at the temple and didn't realize it until three days later? But something will happen after this voice has spoken. This Jesus will come out and he will start preaching. And he has only got one message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then from that moment, for the next three years, this man will do some of the most amazing things. He will perform a miracle. Sometimes he'll open the eyes of a blind man by just simply touching. And sometimes he'll just take a little scoop of dirt Mix it together with some spit and make it into mud and open the eyes that way. Sometimes he'll just look at a man and tell him to get up and take his mat and he'll walk. And sometimes he lifts up his hand to a man who's drowning in the water and he'll pick him up and that man will walk on water. He'll do all sorts of amazing things. He'll meet a widow who loses her only son as she's exiting her city so that she can go bury him only for the funeral to stop so that this Jesus of Nazareth this Jesus of Nazareth can mourn with her, raise her son, and then celebrate with her. He'll perform all these miracles because he's got a message. It isn't just repentance for the kingdom of heaven at his hand. The message is, is that you can be forgiven. And, and if you're paying attention, if you read all four, you just you read it, not like a law. Not like a set of instructions, you just read it for what it truly is, a narrative of the biggest and greatest rescue story of them all. You start, you start putting pieces together. And you start realizing that the biggest problem that faces people isn't a man who sits on a throne. You realize that? Yeah. <laughs> that the biggest issue that is facing people it's not a man who sits in power. It's not a man who sits on a throne. It's not a policy. It's not a piece of legislation. It's none of that. It's none of that at all. You see, what, what plagues people, the true enemies of people, you actually you can't see with your eyes, you can't hear with your ears, you can't touch with your hands, you can't smell with your nose, but you know how powerful they are, and I know how powerful they are. They're things that just plague your conscience. Because no matter how much you like God, like God's chosen leader in that first narrative, you commit so much wrong that you just got to absolutely run away. That's the only way to deal with it, only to realize you can't run away from it. Because you carry it here. And you carry it here. You realize that God's greatest enemies, the enemies of him and the enemies of his people. They're not found on military bases. They're not found halfway across the world. They're found in plots of land that have these little stones that are laid over them. And they begin with these words, here lies, you know the rest, don't you? You can fill in the blank because you have people who in those fields, don't you? I do too. And you realize that the greatest enemies are not those who tax you. They're not those who forcibly take from you. But they're deeper and they're darker. And this Jesus of Nazareth has come to rescue us from those. But he doesn't do it by pulling out a sword, he doesn't raise a militia or an army. He doesn't make a declaration of war. He doesn't drop bombs from 30,000 feet in the air. He doesn't jump out of an airplane and parachute into enemy territory. 
He doesn't go and wield a mighty pen so that he can write a piece of legislation that finally changes everything. He enters into a city with the, crowds, with the cries of Hosanna from a crowd only to know that on what we call Good Friday, which is amazing and ironic, isn't it? That the most darkest of things that happened in human history He goes to a cross. And now we find, we find him meeting evil on its own terms. He meets the great enemy of the people, who is described like a lion who goes around and he prowls and he's looking for someone to devour. And this enemy uses things like that are referred to as sin and temptation and fear and death and guilt and shame and other things. And he meets that enemy, and in the most shocking of ways, unlike the previous chosen leader, he wields no staff, but takes a beating by a staff. He commits no miracle, and yet he commits the greatest miracle. He has the power to save himself, and instead he exercises it so that he can stay on the cross. He's buried in a tomb because he chose to live a life of poverty by people who actually cared. But as they're taking his body off of the cross, they are beyond sad and sorrowful because we put all of our eggs in this man's basket. And now we go to bury him because death has the final word, doesn't it? Only for three days later, by no will or strength or wisdom of man, whatever was in that tomb, whatever is being held by that tomb is free. And he walks out. And so we find our seven themes in this Jesus. And we learn that this wicked tyrant is the devil himself. And through his weapons, he enslaves everybody or attempts to enslave everybody in this room. And he aims to keep us there. You remember what you did last week, don't you? You remember what you said? You can't come back from that decision. You remember how awful you are? If not, I'm going to use this mirror to remind you. You remember what you did 30 years ago? You make your bed, you got a lie in it. He uses all of that and more. Until this man out of Nazareth arises, and he's no ordinary man. And on the cross, this man, instead of you and I being plagued with anything and everything that we have ever said, thought, said, or done, this man is plagued on the cross with beatings and with stabbings, and with spit, and with mockery. And he is allowed to be taken, but instead of coming on the other side of the Red Sea, he is crushed by the Red Sea that is death. Only, only to come out on the other side three days later, alive. We call it the resurrection. And this man, now that he is alive, he offers freedom. And he offers a new way of living. He even offers you to become a new creation if you want. Not a 2.0, not an upgrade, but an entirely new person from the inside out. And he does so by rescuing us through sacrifice. And every first day of the week, we are reminded that we were rescued, not by our own wisdom, not by our own might, not by our own strength, not by our own anything. We were reminded every first day of the week we were rescued because there is a God who is loving and gracious and kind and who did for us what we can never do for ourselves. Even if we are in the thick of, an, of, of slavery that is called an addiction, even if we left and have been gone for so long, even if we committed the greatest acts of evil, 
He rescues us through sacrifice. This is my body. This is my blood. And freedom is not found in an elected official. And freedom is not found by putting the right individual in power. Freedom is not found by reading the next great book that's coming out or the most amazing podcast that you have ever heard. Freedom is found in one place from here on out. It is found in a man by the name of Jesus. You will not find it in your heart. You will not find it in your own mind. You will not find it in your pursuit of academics or wealth. You will not find it in any source of comfort or security. All of those things, if they are outside of Jesus, are temporary at best. You will find them and only find them in Jesus. And just like God gave His presence to a physical nation, this Jesus, before He leaves, wherever you go, whatever you encounter, for however long you live on this earth, I am with you until the end of the age. Knowing that when it's our turn to encounter death, on the other side, as a promised land that you know of as an eternity with God. Now, so what? A couple of things. All of this is called the good news. Now, that means i got to say something for a moment, and that is this. What we mostly hear on the news is not news. It's to just gain advertisement. And to make money. But at its core, the term news is to indicate that something has happened somewhere. An event has happened somewhere that impacts your life and the lives of others. Whether they know it or not, for the rest of their life on this earth. And the news is that Jesus lived, died, buried, and was resurrected over 2,000 years ago. We literally measure our calendar by that event. I wonder what it would look like for your life to be measured by that event. Jesus, church, Jesus is alive today. Jesus, by being alive today, is the rightful king of everything that we know and that we don't know. The rulers of this earth are called to recognize this reality. But in case they don't, there is a group of people that this Jesus has called out that says, I'm going to plant you and you're going to be my mouthpiece. And you're going to be the ones that point back to this event. And you're going to tell people. And more importantly, you're going to show people why this news impacts everybody, whether they recognize it or not. And you're not just going to bring their news so that you can change a mind. You're going to bring the news so that it can change a heart. And the beginning of that news is this. That it's that specific group of people. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And you are to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, how is that love supposed to be? Well, you love as I have loved you. You do for others what I did for you. But they don't see it. You didn't see it either. But they're not going to appreciate it. I don't appreciate it the way I'm supposed to. You love anyway. And you're going to infiltrate. And you're going to overcome. But you're not going to do so by screaming the loudest, yelling the loudest. You're going to do so. Because you're going to take off the cloak that someone demands, and if they demand it, you're going to give them your shirt too. And when you're forced to go one mile, you're going to look at that individual, and because he is risen and because he is king, You're going to go two miles. You're going to give 
And you're not going to think twice about what you're losing because you're not losing anything anyway. You're going to pray because you know who is the king and who controls everything. You're going to treat others the way that you want to be treated, and that includes you're going to talk to others the way that you want to be spoken to. People now are not enemies to be conquered, but people to give the good news. And you're going to do some of the most radical things. It's going to go against your very nature. When they harm you, when they speak evil of you, when they go against you, you're going to love them. You're going to bless them. And you're going to do good to them. The king has spoken. But he hasn't spoken with a demanding presence. He has spoken by going to the cross. And the engine that drives it all is love revealed in full self-sacrifice. So about a year after all these events, a man will find himself, along with some traveling companions, preaching in a place called Antioch Pisidia. And he'll put it like this. We bring you the good news that what God has promised to the fathers, that he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. And that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and that by him, everyone who believes is free. What will happen on Friday will indeed be good. It'll be the worst thing imaginable. But it will be good. Church, this is our story. This is our reality. Now, go live it. Go live it. If you're not a Christian, if you have not come to this Jesus, well, I hope that what you've heard from him and this word has been good to your ears. There is nothing that is beyond his reach, and that includes you. So if you're ready to be rescued and to be free and to live a life, joy, and peace, hope, and kindness, and making a true difference in this world, he lives up to every promise he has ever made. And he can live up to that promise to you today. We want to encourage you to hear the words of this Jesus. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. We can help you. Why don't you come as we stand in?